Can I take me on? So, uh, welcome everyone. This is the uh, second in what never was never intended to be a series of uh, co-production uh, conversations, but has somehow ended up being so. Um, it's no longer co-production week, but as uh, Joe Langley said to us in the preparation for this, co-production is not just for Christmas. So um, we thought we'd have another, another, another bash at this. We're delighted to uh, invite um, uh, a new guest onto, uh, onto the conversation this week. Um, and I'll ask um, Ollie to introduce himself shortly. Um, we do want to make the point that um, in all seriousness, we, uh, we want this to be a diverse conversation. We, uh, we recognize that currently it's um, Liz being surrounded by um, slightly aging uh, white blokes and we want to... Uh, we I was going to say it's what I've always dreamed of. Yeah, yeah. Not, not quite. <laughs> not quite and now it's ended up Liz I'm sure um, but in all seriousness we you know we, we rec absolutely recognize that and we have um, uh, guests that will be coming on uh, hopefully later in the year that will um, provide a, a different viewpoint on this and that's really important to us in, in all seriousness. Um, so uh, if I could ask the um, uh, the guest to uh, introduce themselves and uh, we'll, we'll start with, uh, with you, Ollie, if that's okay. Yeah, hi, uh, thanks for inviting me. So I'm Ollie Williams. I'm currently at King's College London. I'm funded by, I'm on a funded fellowship uh, by this institute, so the Healthcare Improvement Studies Institute. And what I'm looking at in particular is the role that co-production plays within patient and public involvement in health research. So that particular context, so co-production happens in lots of different places in lots of different ways, as you spoke about last week, but I'm looking at particularly the PPI context. Great, thanks Ollie. Uh, Liz? Um, so I'm, my name's Liz Fletcher. I'm, um, I'm a qualified occupational therapist um, uh, working the quality team in Sheffield Health and Social Care at the moment. Do you want me to say why I'm interested in co-production? Yeah. Um, well, I was having a think about it and um, I, I started work as a healthcare assistant um, in a forensic psychiatric ward uh, 20 years ago. And, um, and that experience um, uh, is partly sort of why I'm sort of so passionate about co-production and, um, and wanting it to ultimately change sort of um, the way healthcare is delivered, because what I experienced there um, in, in the ward was um, quite inc incredible, really. The culture was very strange. Um, there was very unkind culture. Um, staff were mean to staff. Um, patients uh, were patients and they knew their place. Um, it was very risk focused and um, people weren't seen as people, I didn't feel at the time. I, I didn't come from sort of a health background at all and my family didn't really. So I went from an insurance admin worker um, to, an, a, to an experience in this sort of health um, world and it completely shocked me. And, uh, and I suppose that initial experience sort of still lingers with me today. And although I've experienced better health services as I've gone through working in different areas, um, there's still so much that can, can be improved. And um, for me, the only way that I've seen that I feel hopeful about is, is co-production. And um, in the sense that, you know, that we're all coming together from all different backgrounds. And, um, and I suppose it gives me hope personally as a professional, that this is a way that we can truly work things out together rather than there being such division in, in power and in people um, and you know, uh, uh, yeah, and, and letting certain people rule the roost, really. Mm. Yeah. It's really important. It speaks to a lot of the core values, doesn't it, about what what co-production is there to is there to um, to facilitate. Uh, Dan. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. Uh, so my name's Dan Wollaston Home. Um, I'm a nurse by background, uh, and I've worked in health services research for the past. Uh, several years. I'm now the director of the Centre for Quality Improvement and Clinical Audit at the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists. So that, I think I win on the long title. <laughs> Although, Rob, if you do your full one, it's quite long, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, yeah, that's me. Thanks, Dan. Uh, and Joe, can, can I ask you to introduce yourself, but also would you mind just doing a quick summary of kind of some of the key topics that um, 
that we covered uh, that we covered last week, and then perhaps we might ask Ollie to respond to to that and just get his thoughts. I'll do my best. Um, yeah, just make sure you drag me back if it stops being quick. Um, <laughs> uh, so I'm Joe Langley. I'm a design engineer and academic in Lab for Living at Sheffield Hallam University. Um, I'm uh, I've been working with co-design, doing co-design um, in healthcare, health well-being sort of, um, fields for a number of years. Um, and I'm really interested in the um, skills, practices um, and processes that design brings to these uh, forms of collaborative working, um, whether people name it co-design, co-production, um, co-creation, whatever that is. Um, and I think that leads nicely into the uh, sort of start the summary from last week. So that's that's kind of where we started is this kind of diversity of interpretations, uh, nomenclature, um, expressions, manifestations of co-production. Um, and whilst there are kind of some people wanting to nail down um, certain definitions, um, there's also this kind of freedom of, of expression, which uh, I think sits nicely with the the sort of fundamental philosophy of what co-production is. But underneath it, there are these two kind of drivers of of democratic um, and pragmatic sort of uh, rationales behind them. I think Ollie, we, we we kind of referenced your paper about it. This talks about the I think you talk about the moral imperative and the sort of technocratic um, imperatives. Um, but underneath all of those, I think going to the heart of whatever it is is this issue of intentionality. Um, and we kind of came full circle last week with the discussion to kind of a concluding point about the relationship between intentionality and humility of people going in to do it. So accepting that no one person has all the answers and it's got to be a bringing together of, of multiple um, perspectives, not just for that kind of moral democratic reasons, but because the answer or fragments of the answer lie within different stakeholders. Um, there's also the, the point we sort of touched on last week around the potential misuse or mislabeling of co-production um, and the you know harm that that can do so I think again that refers to kind of some of the stuff that Ollie's talked about before which is the co-biquity and Dan referred to PPI biquity um, yeah but I only made that up okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and th there was also a kind of theme as well running through last week around the sort of undervaluing of code production as well to undervaluing of the skills and training necessary so Liz made a point about you know are we in danger of losing skilled people who can do this well um, and administer participate um, manage lead facilitate whatever it is the kind of co-production and when it's done badly that how damaging that can be but also the undervaluing of co-production in terms of the time and resources necessary to do it properly um, and undervaluing the the kind of rationale but also again coming back to your kind of provocative question that you asked Rob last week so evidence of the benefits so if you put aside the moral imperative for one moment and just focus on the kind of technocratic rationale what is the evidence of those um, benefits um, and we are kind of really almost too lightly i would say touched on the kind of practicalities of how do you do it but it's such a big subject that i think that might be something we kind of go into across a series of these conversations with different people um and i think one of the things i'd be really i'm still fascinated in i'm going to continue to push this question is how the practicalities of how you do it have changed in kind of lockdown social distancing sort of scenarios um because i've heard a lot of kind of stuff on the internet about you know jumping onto digital platforms and just doing co-production through but i'm fascinated by what's lost from those kind of points of social interaction how the, the connections between imagination empathy um ideas experiences that don't quite translate into these kind of digital environments um i think i think that's a kind of very Brilliant brief summary but if there's anything i've missed just just no, jump in. i think that was spot on joe and and, and i think that um it's the co-production arena about the impact of the um delivery over digital platforms i think is the same way we're talking about teaching and education and you know the whole point around learning and how we learn um you know as part of a much broader conversation as we you know accelerate towards this um proliferation of digital tools we have to be really mindful about how we learn and ultimately we're, we're still people but um so perhaps ollie could i invite you to maybe th there's lots to go out there it's kind of a sweet shop of co-production which bit of pick and mix do you want to go for first 
Well, I think it makes sense to start with a definition, partly because I don't really want to get too bogged down in it, um, because you, you spoke around it quite a lot last, last week. And I really liked, um, it was what, what Joe said, I think that, uh, oh, and you all agreed that the definition seems to be less important than the intention. So what is the intention of the work that you're doing? What are you going in to do that work for? Um, but then, you know, they are related and it, and it is interesting because I think Joe picked up on something that I'm really, really interested in. I'm currently writing something about and have published a few bits on where he talked about that. If you don't have a definition, they used the phrase I really liked it was that some people will abuse the elast elasticity of the lack of a definition. So then it can become different things to different people in different ways. And that's why you come back to the intentionality of what are you trying to, trying to achieve? And I think that the lack of a, um, or the lack of a clear definition has to some extent led itself to co-production becoming a buzzword. But I don't think the main driver for it becoming a buzzword is the lack of a definition. I think the main driver for it becoming a buzzword is what that term who took that term on and what people were trying to achieve with it so the context that it that it was within so i think if you wanted to go to definitions for instance so uh, so the work that i'm doing is in patient and public involvement and so you've got the nihr um who have involved nihr involved so it's kind of the body that is trying to make sure that uh, patient and public involvement is done well and how can you do it effectively and how can you hold people to account to do it and to support people more generally so the definition that they would have of um, public involvement is that uh, it's research uh, being carried out with or by members of the public rather than to, about or for them. And then it goes on to say this includes, for example, working with research funders to prioritise research, offering advice as members of project steering groups, commenting on and developing research materials, undertaking interviews with research participants. But I think what's quite key there is that with and by, or with or by, rather than to, about, or for. And one of the reasons that's quite key is because it's delineating there, or sort of describing both good and bad practice. And I think what you see, particularly in the space that I know that all of us work in, which is health research, is that Involve started to embrace the word co-production a lot more in, in order to address some of the issues they had around tokenistic practice and bad practice and poor practice. So it was to try and move the, the PPI field, I think, away from this um, to, about, or for, and more towards with or by. Now, what I think then become a bit problematic is that that term is a loaded term. It's got different histories. There's different branches of literature where that have kind of developed over time in different ways, but there wasn't necessarily an adopting of that term with all of that knowledge. So then you've got a term that's describing a whole bunch of things that doesn't really work, I don't think. And what that's led to is it's a sort of a diluting, or as, as um, Joe said, sort of there's an elasticity which can be abused, I think. And I think it is worth saying that, you know, you did touch on from power a bit last week within academic or research environments, academics generally have the power, so the funders and then the academics. Academics are by their nature, essentially because of where they are, it, what, what their field is, they, they learn how to play the game, as in, you know, how do you get research funding? How do you get things published? And if they see that a funder is endorsing a term like co-production, they will try and bend that term to, to meet their needs. And I was wondering, when you were speaking last week, if, if any of you have had had that experience or you knew of projects where you would say that things were happening that were being described as co-production, but you would find it quite difficult to describe what was being done as co-production in any sort of meaningful or sort of wholesome way. Mm. <laughs> so, uh, so yes, yes then. <laughs> yeah, well, I think, I think for me, the, it comes back to the intent again mm -hmm. you know and, and there's a there's a um within all these things there's that spectrum of um uh, you know ability and um understanding and competence uh versus um actually uh, you know a desire to do things in the right way and you can start off with the intent to do things in the right way but actually what you're doing is very tokenistic but you might have a perception that that's what co-production is so I think so, that's, yeah, yeah that's then that's then key because if we take, so like I said, 
with what involves trying to do with that term. So then we can start to say, well, the, exactly what Joe said last week, that the definition is less important than the intent. Within this environment where, you know, health research, that is how the term is in contemporary usage being used. It's trying to move people away from more tokenistic, um, problematic practice into things that are more involved, more genuine, more collaborative. Now, there then becomes a problem because there's differences between co-production, co-design, collaboration, those sorts of things. But you can't, I think if you're operating in those spaces, you can't operate outside of the knowledge that co-production had a particular term. When people use it, they mean like there's a reason why they're using it or it's come to be um, a, a signifier that things are more collaborative, more inclusive, more diverse. And therefore, if your practice, if you're calling something co-production and it doesn't align with those things, there is gamesmanship there, I, I think. I think just to go back to your question, Ollie, and um, it, it, there was a, a pregnant pause there whilst no one answered, which I think spoke volumes, but I think it, it does have to be addressed. And um, I, I would absolutely say yes. I, I'm not going to name names or kind of put Don't projects out to, there, yeah. but I, I think that there is, um, I, I, throughout the, the time that um, I've been doing this, there is an awareness that um, there are of diversity of um, perspectives and part of my um, uh, as I see my kind of role isn't just understanding what I do and how I do it and the impact of that but also trying to um, build capacity in a greater sense so working with people who I know might not have the same perceptions as I do or perspectives as I do but trying to um, through a kind of process of attrition almost convert or kind of uh, win them over by showing them the value and the benefits of doing it in different ways um and you know that there have been people who have been um that we've worked with and then i speak for dan here as well i think um who have been uh skeptical uh, and even cynical and and they have at the end of these processes gone yeah that's right you know when can we what can we do next what, what, and so on um I think, there's, I mean, there's one specific project that stands out in my mind as being a, a group that I knew were not so um, perhaps open. Um, and they, I mean, the situated, the kind of, e even the way that the, the, my involvement in the project was defined was, you know, quite a, a, a small proportion of the budget um, was offered to do this co-production co activity. And when it got to the nuts and bolts of doing it, um, it was very much about you know we've done this research this is how it should be how can we make them accept this as as the kind of intervention um, and where there were kind of direct conflicts between what the evidence said from their research and what participants were saying from this co-production process it was oh well we can't do that we've, we've got to do this and it created a kind of real um tension in my role as the kind of coordinating and leading the co-production process um, and trying to make sure that we represented the views and in fact what we ended up doing was creating kind of two sets of of prototypes and solutions one that, that did what the researchers wanted and said and one that was more of what the participants in the co-production said and it almost ended up as a point where they kind of ended up in parallel almost in competition with each other mm -hmm. um, and now ultimately what was taken forward into some kind of evaluation um, that's where the control again landed with the researchers um, and I think it is it, it's incredibly challenging to um, whilst all the efforts could be made to kind of try to win over people and show them the kind of benefits and values it there is a certain feeling of powerlessness um, in even as, as a kind of speaking as a person who wears multiple hats as a kind of co-production facilitator but also as a researcher and academic um in those initiatives and projects where i don't have any power either i'm co-opted into these processes almost as a an afterthought and you reckon in some instances you recognize that and you know it but you kind of hope that some kind of involvement can change something somewhere in the system um but it, it, it's, it can be incredibly frustrating. Mm. Now, fortunately, with that group over a series of three, four, five projects, there has been a gradual shift and a change. Um, and I'm now more involved in writing proposals with them rather than being written into proposals. So there's a kind of sequence of change which brings hope, I guess. Um, 
but it, it it's 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 something that um is equally kind of frustrating to be involved with um but i think there's a certain kind of tenacity because is is required because in the whole sense of co-production there needs to be a, i think the change needs to be bottom up mm. i don't think it can be a top down change because that's where people then start to gamify it if it's imposed saying you must have co-production by the funders in your research projects people don't do it genuinely it becomes this gamified thing yeah. whereas if you can convert people from the bottom up so they see and experience the benefits and values for themselves then it becomes something they introduce into their proposals willingly rather than being imposed by funders yeah. and so on I mean, dan yeah. les what, what, what are your thoughts um I suppose I just wanted to talk about um, my experience, I suppose, as being a, a healthcare professional. And, um, and as I said at the beginning, kind of that initial experience that I had. And as an OT, you're kind of trained to think about working in partnership with people. So that this kind of idea of co-production was, I felt pretty natural to me personally and to my professional background. So I had a strong sort of sense of desire to want to implement co-production um, within my practice. And I would say over the last sort of 10 years, um, I'm sure I could comment on, you know, other people doing co-production badly. But I think probably I've, I've tried to implement co-production or, um, you know, degrees of co-production sort of, uh, you know, involving people, um, um, try, you know, trying to get more of a group together or whatever. And, um, and I've probably made, you know, certain mistakes because, I think the the system around me or my service or whatever I don't know how much it was valued or understood and uh, and so I was always trying to kind of think about co production within the constraints of of the service that I worked within and um, and so I have made a series of mistakes I'm sure that people could you know could have criticized at the time but I very much value the experience um, of making them mistakes and looking back I'm sure I I'm sure I kind of you know I'm sure I annoyed a few people or whatever but did I seriously harm anybody I'm not sure and um, and I'm, I don't know whether it's right or wrong that I've had these experiences and that I've made mistakes as I've gone along but I've certainly learned a lot by doing that and um, but um, but I also hope that in the future, I suppose that that there is a much more understanding around how much how much we how much planning and thought and dedication needs to go into doing co-production well. Because um, I, I suppose I feel like I have. I don't want to compliment Dan too much because um, that would be awful for everybody. No, don't do that. Don't I, do that. No. Yeah. But um, you know, I suppose being involved in the co-production work that Dan and Remy sort of um, led for the Move More for Mental Health project, I felt that for me, um, that was kind of more sort of the gold standard of what we really, really want to see. Mm. And we want to see that all the time, embedded in practice all the time, please, but we're not there yet. And, um, and, so, and so I suppose my point is I've learned from making lots of mistakes and actually, you know, I, I want to participate in discussions like this to encourage people as well to think about what they can do and, and how they can learn for themselves about co-production. And I suppose it'd be interesting to hear from you lot about, mm. you know, is, is that a right way to go? Or do we need to think <laughs> about kind of, should people be kind of, you know, n not act like me? So is it courses or something before? Yeah, there's the training and the skills and the kind of, you know, I, I mean, Dan, do you want to call yeah, in some of that? Yeah, so I think, um, I think Les, you, you've made a really, uh, insightful intervention there because actually what you've done in describing your kind of practice as a healthcare practitioner is talk to a kind of I think two out of kind of three or maybe more kind of areas that we're looking at so there's there's the person-centered care so working collaboratively with people to develop their their, their care and, and and I think that is that is a form of co-production there are uh, there are models around person-centered care in nursing and in other fields around how you achieve that um, and I think that's that's one really interesting area and actually I was struck by some of the Twitter feedback from the last uh, posting that Rob made from last week there was a big conversation about person-centered care within that and, and, and 
I'm not really, uh, conflating, not in a bad way, but people hearing the word co-production and thinking about person-centered care. You also then refer to kind of work where, because as your role has changed and developed over time, you're now working in a kind of quality improvement role alongside your clinical practice, is this health services design stuff. So can we bring service users and other people together with the service providers to change how we deliver care so it better fits their needs? And so I think that again is a really interesting role. And I think a lot of Joe and my work over the last 15 years have, have been around that. Um, and I think that was before we even started thinking about perhaps this, this other thing, which is how co-production is expressed in research and implementation, be it knowledge mobilization, otherwise. And that also doesn't talk to the challenging description of PPI as defined by the NIHR under various things, but that's probably something else again. So I, I think it, it, it is important to talk to those different kind of areas of co-production because I think the methods are different, the, the, the tools and training are different. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know if that's kind of expanded or... So, well, Ali, can I come, what, what's your thoughts yeah. on you know, the tools, the training, I mean... Uh, well, I think it's really, to jump on the back of what Liz just said, Liz describing her, um, her personal experience there, and a lot of it is around sort of the individual nature of it. Have I, should, should people like me be able to make these mistakes, or I came in and I made these mistakes? Or, but what she was also talking about was that she was working within a system already, and she didn't know whether people valued this way of working or doing things in this way. And I think that that's what, that's my interest really as a, as a sociologist and coming into this field is, what are the contexts in which these are taking place? And I think it picks up on what Joe was saying as well, is that, you know, um, how do you get people to, to want to do this work? And part of it, that the system or the structure disincentivizes it anyway. So it's, it's much more difficult to get publications in high impact journals, all of those sorts of things, all of the standard um, ways that, that it's success is defined in, in academia generally goes against co-producing things or co-designing things so i think that's difficult so it, in so, so probably to deal with some of the, what i was picking up on quite like latent guilt that liz may have uh it, it's a systematic issue rather than any failing that liz would have that's not to say that we don't all as individual practitioners have a responsibility to learn things and do things differently but i think we do need to look at the structure and that's what the paper that you mentioned last week is all about is when you see failings in co-production or co-design within the system, do we, uh, do we focus on what, where that failure is taking place and which individuals doing that? Or do we focus on the culture that, and the structure that generally doesn't support more co-produced practice? In terms of the means of co-production, um, this is where I think it's quite interesting because my knowledge of Dan and Joe and sort of my interaction with their work I would say that a lot of their stuff that they do, I would feel really comfortable calling it co-design. But I don't know whether it really reaches into co-production outside of a really sort of broad understanding of what we might call co-production. And where that comes from, I think, is about um, at what point people are working together. So when you were talking last week, there was a distinction kind of made between co-production and co-design. And I think I was trying to think about how I might try and sum that up. So I was thinking with co-design, I think it, there is a legitimacy around sort of there being a problem or a dilemma that's already established. And then you're involving people who it makes sense to involve. So if you're like redesigning a service, you would involve patients, carers, the healthcare workers, you would have people like Joe, you would have people like Dan, you'd have people like Liz, all part of your project because you want that team to do that. But the task is already set really, as in, you you're to redesign this service in some way now with co-production sort of a, a more a sort of specific understanding that i would have away from the more general understanding would be that the problem or dilemma of something is not yet established so you would be going to groups of people and you would be talking about what is important to them or what do they find difficult or what would they want to be researched so for instance um, there's organizations like, um, I've just had, uh, I did a talk recently or we, as part of the panel, which is really great actually for Health Services Research UK conference. It's all about 
um, equity and inclusion um, and diversity and how that might be achieved. Um, and I talk, that's why I don't really want to talk too much about the definitions of co-production here, because I already talked about that in, 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 in that session, I sort of um, went through it quite quickly. So I could give you a link to that at the end. But two of the organizations that we spoke to on that, uh, or that I spoke with on that organization was Black Thrive, an organization set up um, by Natalie Creary, I think is her, sir, how you say her surname. And she's in Lambeth and she set up, it's about, um, black people's mental health, particularly people in uh, Lambeth, that community. And it's about helping create a structure where they can define what the research agenda needs to be for them. What's important to them in their community? What, what, what do they need? What do they want more information on? What can they provide more information about? So it's how can they be involved in the process as well? And then there's also the, um, the organization and ambitious about autism. And that, it, that was, really incredible i think to, to hear about them as well sort of in line with uh, black uh, black thrive that they were working with generally that we were um, talking about the work that they've done with young people um uh, young autistic people or people with autism and they were talking about i think that there was a stat that when we put the video out that lots of people came back to so they spoke about how there's an uh, organization called autistica who did a bit of research within um the community of people uh, with autism and they found that only 27 percent of the uk research money was uh, for research on autism was spent on the top 10 community priorities so the, the, the priorities that the people in that uh, who um have autism or or um define themselves as having autism um what their priorities would be only 27 percent of the research funding was going in that way so again so it would be about going to those communities and finding out what those 10 priorities are and then what, building up projects from that rather than going in and doing more co-design work so i don't know if is that fair joe would you say is that fair or dan would you say that's fair of what how i would some sort of that i would place your work more solidly in co-design rather than co-production I think a uh, sort of large bulk of our work would would fit in there. Um, I, I think so. In a lot of cases, we get asked or invited to join projects when that um, collaborative work of uh, defining problems with participants, patients, um, representatives of, of a community have done that work. So in a sense, it's front ended by that. So it's a continuation of, of co-production. But I mean, this is where getting down into Kind of details of, of definitions becomes um, a kind of very murky waters because I know in the kind of uh, local authority world they make this kind of clear distinction between co-creation, co-design co and co-production so in, in a kind of process way the production bit is very much about the producing something at the end of it whereas the co-creation part is that bit that you've just described where you kind of come together to create a sense of what problems might exist within a community the co-design bit is the middle bit where you kind of generate ideas and create solutions and the production bit is where the community comes together to actually produce the service mm -hmm. bring it into life um, so that's mm -hmm. kind of very much aligned to a kind of um technical manufacturing production line model where you have the creation the design the production um kind mm -hmm. of thing so i think these, these terms are kind of used by different sectors in these kind of different ways um and i think it, I think from the in a research context in the this is why I kind of tend to just stick to the term co-production it, it is very much about as you've described it's people having an input into investing in the definition identification of the problems because I mean Dan you always pull out these statistics about how the, the kind of quantities of m proportions of money that are invested in kind of developing drug therapies yeah, when if you talk to people what they want are um completely different things yeah um, so i mean i'm sure this is the, the so it's the james linder lines priority setting stuff which is nihr funded really excellent work and they, there's a really good quote that shows what people are interested in and how much is funded and they're basically opposite lines yeah. and actually it, it, it talks to um, that they're much more likely to fund drugs than physical therapy but people are far more interested in physical therapy that they can do to themselves and rehabilitation than they are in drugs 
but it's really hard to do research <laughs> and there's no money in doing research in rehab um, uh, as opposed to if you can get a wonder drug that you can get on the right kind of formulary then you can make a mint but, mm, but that, 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 that's where you see the structural issue isn't it because the, one of the reasons why it would be difficult to do that research is because it's not funded not yeah. because it is actually innately difficult to do that research at all no. yeah. we have got one or two examples of um that kind of entire process i mean the one that stands out head and shoulders above the others is the head up project um well that, that was a, a group of people living with mnd motor neuron disease who came forwards and said that as a group and discussions amongst themselves privately they had identified this need the fact that neck support systems that they were given were just inadequate for their to respond to their needs um and that stimulated a project which had if I think um, three or four unsuccessful applications before eventually it got funding. Um, we realized with the unsuccessful applications that we needed to do more kind of technological work with um, patient representatives and healthcare professionals to develop concepts. But when it went on, I mean, it's, it's had um, involvement from uh, patient representatives, families, healthcare professionals throughout and on now. So they're still involved, even though there's a company in Chesterfield making these things, they're still involved. They're still involved in broadcasting the work, in talking about their experiences of using it, in feeding back to get the product um, improved. Um, and it's a national network. Um, and you know, I still I still there's there's videos that have come of, of people who have, you know, um, taking holidays, hiring cars in Norway, um, driving again, when they had written off the ability to drive because they could no longer you know, move their um, head and neck and so on. Um, and it, there's, it's kind of, it, it is a, I mean, the, the sense of um, fulfillment that you get from those initiatives. Um, and it's, it, it's, I think one of the important things we've managed to maintain in that particular project is this recognition and attribution back to the original patient group always so whilst academics have been able to claim bits with papers and so on the project always talks about it came from these patients yeah. and that yeah. attribution i think is really important because again it's something i pick up on from one of the papers that you wrote recently ollie about i think the challenge back to catherine oliver's paper about stakeholders having to pay um, and I, th I find that a really, um, to be seen as a, a, an equal partner in the process, I find that a really challenging concept to kind of um, think about because in most instances, not only are they not paid, but they're contributing their time. Um, mm -hmm. And rather than paying, the idea that actually maybe we should, we're, we're being paid to participate in this. So the idea mm -hmm. that actually to be equitable, we should perhaps be paying people to be involved mm -hmm. in these things, to contribute their ideas and experiences and their data. I mean, we talk about data and the whole concept of mm -hmm. Google and Facebook mm -hmm. and things like that. And so who owns it? Well, they're contributing their data and in being involved in, in these processes. And it seems that it's, it's not valued in the way that it should be. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, I mean, whether we talk about that more today or whether that's something we pick up on in another conversation, I think that's a really kind of interesting point about the mechanisms of involving individual people in these processes. I mean, I think from a physical activity perspective, we are, for me, it's, it's, quite, it's quite interesting that we are seeing a shift in terms of some of the funders. So if you, if you hear the narratives that's coming out of Sport England's um, strategies and latest work, they are very much shifting their model from... Um, been a um, almost a um, client provider relationship where they have the money and they you know they hand it out based on the kind of the, the numbers of people involved whereas actually now it's much more trying to understand what matters most to people so the work that we've done in Sheffield is um, through the empowered communities program with voluntary action Sheffield has really been driven by that question of what matters most to people in communities let's start with that question um, rather than let's turn up with a, a question about, well, we've got our box of kind of kit that we could, we could use, you know, which sport do you want to play? It's a very different mm. question about what, what matters most. But some of, the com some of the things that I've been reflecting on through that process is, well, communities have been doing this for years. As academics have come along and put kind of a, you know, a, a bow around it or a box around it and a set of kind of criteria that now is now called this thing called co-production where it used to be you know listening social activism social you know and whatever it might want to be and so you know to what one of my questions is to what extent is this a 
um, a product of academia around co-production versus something that's already always been there that we've now chosen to um, harness for our own ends. And I'm just interested in it, you know, is it our agenda that we're driving here because we've, you know, we can kind of put it in well, the box. There's, there's, there's two things there, isn't there? There's a difference between practice and terminology. So I think academia is adopting the terminology, but I think um, that, <laughs> There is a history of the use of co-production in academia that goes back to say the 70s. So that term has been used in academia, but the, the sort of practices that you're talking about go back way, way further. Community practices, activism, co-production generally, when, when people are upset or are angry about the way that co-production may be being misused within academia, it's because they have an understanding that co-production is supposed to mean some sort of radical power sharing. And why I say radical is that it's radical that there is these established organizations and structures that where there is power and it's taking power away from them or, or at least those uh, relinquishing some power and then more stuff from ground up people having power so you know communities speaking um and voicing their concerns and voicing their their needs and voicing their preferences and, and all of those things i think physical activity is an interesting one i mean that that slant is because my background is sociology of sport and i've done plenty of stuff on physical activity and my, my like often i'm looking at health inequalities and how um physical activity is being used in sort of trying to reduce those health inequalities and i think it's it's an awkward um uh, reality for people working in physical activity to have to recognize which is but often by the time um funding or attention is being put on physical activity it's being used to push things down an agenda so it's being used politically so if if you actually went into those communities and you ask people what is it that you need they wouldn't go i'm really fancy going for a jog <laughs> do you know what i mean they would go i i wouldn't mind having a job do, do you know and so it's it's that reality i think the physical i i, I don't undermine like i think it's really important and, and you could absolutely go into some um or um communities indeed i have gone into communities that um you would describe or could be described as deprived communities or deprived neighborhoods and people will say look there's no way for us to do the, this physical activity that we're supposed to be doing or whatever and so they do want to find ways but generally what we know is that if you made people sort of wealthier they would do those things of their own volition anyway so you know physical activity serves that purpose and you're seeing that now i mean you bring up Sport England, but Sport England recently funded or was part of funding of um, a seminar that was reframing coronavirus as a, as a lifestyle disease, which is absolutely ridiculous. And so, again, that's where you see, I don't think if you went through a co process of co-production, you would ever have that sort of session. No one is going, there was somebody before you put that session on is going to go, hang on a minute, it might be a terrible idea to say that COVID-19 is a lifestyle disease. <laughs> yeah, uh, there's a uh, work that Claire um, and Paul did with uh, Mark Hawley around the intact thing, which was looking at um, uh, uh, digital accessibility in, in communities that could be deprived as uh, described as deprived. And one of the things that they came up with um, and came out of the, the community was this actual conflict of things to do with physical activity. So that there's discouragements for people. So the threat of losing benefits if you're seen being active yeah, can actually yeah. be a discouragement for people to take up physical activity. Um, yeah, totally. So I think that there is within the system, it's those structural things again. It yeah. always comes back to the kind of structural things, which um, whether it's in the academic kind of structural systems or the wider political structural mm. systems there are all these barriers that prevent people from um having the, the lifestyles that would be ideal in whatever that is um but also in genuinely participating in the research efforts to improve um well-being and and, and health yeah and i'm not just picking on um, physical activity there but it is a useful example to show that how within a structure say like so we have research agendas and we work in health so generally it's quite a well-funded area of research whereas there's things which are very important areas of um, study which are really important but there isn't funding and so it's but why isn't that the case you know and we so it allows all of these inequalities to exist in the in the creation of knowledge 
um, and the sort of proliferation of knowledge. What, what do we know and then what knowledge do we build upon? Whereas why aren't we finding out about these, these other things and why aren't we doing this other work? And I think that what um, the focus on co-production should help us as academics do is to not think, well, this is my priority because I have a background in doing this. But what, what is it that these local communities want to do? We all work in institutions which have a physical locality, you know, that they are in an actual place and we should want to help serve those communities around that. And universities have historically been quite detached from the, the environments and the local uh, communities that they're part of. And is, is that right? I don't, I don't think so. No, I completely, completely support that. Um, one, yeah. one of the um, things, picking up from what you've just said there, um, and it's not just in the kind of academic world, but Liz was talking about the similar structures um, being kind of opposed to um, uh, co-production within the healthcare systems as well, um, the healthcare providers and institutions. But in healthcare, there's this, there are now quite strong models of interdisciplinary working. Am I fair in saying that? Whereas in academia, part of the structural problems is that the silos are there and there's so much done. Well, however well-intentioned the efforts are of academics to be interdisciplinary, being able to set aside disciplinary agendas and say, okay, what does this community need? Rather than from a physical activity or from a design or engineering or sort of biology, whatever perspective, just sit there and say, okay, as a group of academics, we can all come from our disciplinary perspective, but let's just see what, is needed and then bring our collective knowledge to bear on that particular issue and it may mean that there's more input required from one or two disciplines compared to others but so what 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 is needed then to create that yeah. to make that a reality what's what's got to got to change yeah. I, well i mean for me that that was part of the, the sort of the at the heart of um what the awrc was about actually about bringing together those different academic disciplines. Um, we have the opportunity being in, um, in Darnell where we are to do, you know, to do that in a meaningful way with the community, but that has to be um, authentic, um, you know, and it, it has to be, um, it's about building those relationships, isn't it? And, and that, but doing that in an authentic way and that takes time and investment and it, you know, it can't just be a, a project or a program and, and, um, I think one of the challenges is the, you know, the cycles that we work with, the funding driven, the outputs, you know, uh, that, that mean actually you've got to be in this for the coming right back to our first point about co-production, the intent with which you um, engage in this process has to be about truly trying to understand what matters most for the communities and recognizing your one asset and only one asset, not the most important asset or the one with the loudest voice or the one with the most power. Um, but one asset within um, that, that local context or that microsystem, however you want to describe it. And um, certainly I think when you, when you start to say, okay, what can I bring? Uh, what do I have to offer? These are the things that I could do um, and bring that to the table and, and, and create that sense where everybody has that equal opportunity to do it, that you can start to get some, um, some change in it. And as academics, I think we have to, we have to lay some of that stuff down. Absolutely, and um, I think, but the, to to join those two things together, yours and Joe's, your, your, yours and Joe's comments. So, um, Joe's saying what what needs to change, and you're saying well, academics need to recognise that. But then at the same time, um, funders need to fund that that way of doing research. So the cycle's really problematic, isn't it? it we're caught in these research okay. research cycles. Can we talk about this later. Yeah. Do you mind shutting the door? I'll be finishing. Thanks. You're co-producing tea. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah, we'll be fin we'll be finishing soon. We'll be finishing yeah. soon. Dan, so, what, I mean, sorry, yeah, but the, those, those cycles, those cycles, we we as academics can't break those cycles. It's funders who can break those cycles. So it's it's about respecting. Do you want to work in this way? Do you actually think this way is variable? Uh, this is a valuable way of working. Could we achieve some useful things here? Is it the right thing to do? Um, and if they do, they need to fund that. Um, because at the minute, what, we, what you've got a lot is that some people in, in the field really try to do a lot of work, but they don't have the means to do it. So 
you're getting a hide into nothing a lot of the time because you're trying to make miracles within a system that is going you're swimming upstream basically um and i think that that's really problematic and it's a it's the biggest challenge for co-production i think is how do you get more money into this model of of working to bring together lots of people and to have things being from ground up yeah i, I mean there aren't there aren't any massively short answers to that are there i mean so i, th I think the model that you want is that the community has the funds and they look to rob and say oh you could do this for us and 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 completely change that relationship but that would of course mean that rob's new shiny building would not have got funded in the first place and I, so they, but these are this is the this is the radical change that needs to happen isn't it in order for us to kind of put power and and funding and power in the hands of those communities so they can ask and answer their own questions and yeah and i think that there are there are there is a middle ground as well there in that like so i'm all for giving more money to the communities um but it's not always about money is it resources not just money is it resources is all different types of things so it's how could we actively work together so power you know we have power so part of the resources that we have power, we can do something. So getting funding is one thing, getting resource and, and working together in a collaborative way is, is, is another thing. I think there has been a, a sort of subtle shift recently. So, so Paul Nurse made those references about being more interdisciplinary and there was that shift from independent uh, research councils to the research councils UK, sort of trying to bring them together and combine them. And recent funding calls have, um, so it's the ISCF one is a good example that was talking about social behavior and design led research um, So there are kind of moves towards that but even within those kind of so it's more than just the funders um, Even within those moves. There's still a kind of competition to have a disciplinary um, kind of priority within that because ref is all about discipline submitting kind of papers and outputs and whatever for so people want to the whole track record thing of income and outputs and so on as aligned to specific disciplines and submitted no matter how the funding model changes that's still a kind of mechanism that drives people an incentive that drives people to seek for dominance of a discipline o over others within these initiatives rather than kind of seeking true interdisciplinarity um, but cool. I'm kind of interested as well in, in whether with Liz so from a practice perspective and a kind of similarity with the healthcare model has that as Dan talks about shifting the funding to communities what do you think around the idea of personal budgets has that kind of shifting of finances to patients given them more power in terms of well how long have you got <laughs> <laughs> that is a whole podcast in itself isn't it I mean god personal budgets um when it first when when I first heard about personal budgets, I remember I was a newly qualified OT. I was so excited about it. It just sounded like you know it sounded great, and uh, but slow. <laughs> and I think to the odd person here and there, it's been wonderful. You know, I remember I got ten thousand pounds for somebody with Asperger's. Brilliant. You know, he could spend he had the freedom to spend it on how how we wished. It was great. But could I then repeat that? No. Did the did the funding run out? Yes. It was there. I mean, I'm probably I probably shouldn't be saying all this. I don't know. But you know, there, there's all sorts of problems within that. You know, the the, the you couldn't. You, there was such a lack of choice in terms of what people um, were able to spend their personal budget on, um, going from what laptop people wanted to what gym they wanted to part, uh, to go to um what what personal um support people had i just i i mean the idea of a personal budget is blooming great but the reality of it for me in practice is um absolutely terrible <laughs> i think there's interesting <laughs> and, um, parallels there then if uh, kind of trying to replicate a similar model of are using the finances as a way of shifting power within the research world there's obviously lots of learning that we can take from the kind of parallels of that which could comes with warnings about you know the possible unanticipated now perhaps anticipated dangers of of doing doing exactly that um, but i think is it, it's going back to ollie's point resources are not just about funding 
Mm. And it, I think within um, kind of community-based co-production, the solutions aren't all about funding either. They can't be because you don't have the same amount of funding or financial resources available. But it's looking at inner resources that exist within communities as well. And I know there's inequalities across that as well. That's, that, that's, that's completely true. But I think helping people to um, working with people so that you, it's an asset based kind of approach to looking at um, both identifying issues with them, but also working towards solutions, which mm -hmm. tries to remove some of that um, potential inequality related just to funding. Um, but I think we've got to look at other mechanisms for shifting the power because okay. funding alone doesn't doesn't do that. No. So um, it's, it's necessary, but what our people would say that normally is it's necessary, but insufficient, isn't it? it? You do need the money, the money and the money drives things. But it's what do you do with that then is the next step. And that's why I think these conversations you're having are really useful because these conversations are kind of like if you have money, what are the practices that you would do? What, what people do you need? What skills do you need? What sort of people and teams do you need? How can you make these things happen? Mm -hmm. So if you know, you know, if tomorrow we were to have a, a more equitable distribution of research funds, how would we put that to use in a sort of inclusive and diverse mm -hmm. and equitable way? Um, so, 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 so for, um, for me, um, that, Dan, I'm going to come to you in a sec because in true sort of co-production conversation style, it's probably worth waiting for. Is kind of what we mentioned uh, last week. So I'll come to you. And then, Ollie, maybe the final word is our, our guests uh, in this conversation. Perhaps um, you could um, maybe guide some of the thoughts that we might want to go next with, with our co-production converse, conversation. Would that be okay? Just to throw a few things out there from, from your thoughts. So, Dan, just to come back on that, and then Ollie will come to you just to close. No, no, it's, it's, it's just one of my uh, favourite kind of examples of community-led co-production, which was a, a village on the Manchester side of the Peak District that was uh, flooded uh, uh, successive winters uh, in the early thousands, 2000s, 2000s, that would be a bit weird, wouldn't it? Anyway, so, um, uh, but they had a kind of community meeting and some of the elders in the community suggested that this didn't used to happen and what was different now and they commissioned a local university history department to do a kind of study of the field work that had been done previous in previous years for a few hundred pounds and this individual was able to contribute that knowledge and then the community were able to apply for some funding from uh, i think from the big lottery to enact some of these flood defense systems and that that to me is kind of that that to me starts to talk to that kind of bringing together both the, the, the different assets from academia, from the community knowledge, from knowledge of the current and present and past, and then be able to use that together to apply for funding to deliver those changes that actually make a difference in the area. I just think there are models out there, there are success stories, and perhaps there's some chance to curate some of that and put that in front of people as well. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So, Ollie, thanks for joining us. What are you, you going to leave us with? Well, um... I've managed to talk, we, we've managed to talk for about an hour and I haven't mentioned the paper that came out yesterday. So <laughs> I'll bet that is, but not just because it is a plug, but because it's genuinely relevant. So, so the title of that paper comes from a, a, a saying, which I, or an expression, which I, I think all of you probably would have heard working in this field, because you see it around quite a lot, which is, is co-production just really good PPI, right? So that's kind of like a starting point for my research project was that, because what's really interesting about that question is when you say that to people, it, it's kind of quite divisive. You get two big groups and then s some smaller groups that have different ideas. But you get people who really fiercely will tell you that it absolutely is. And you'll get people who really fiercely will tell you that it absolutely isn't. But what's interesting or what I found interesting like a couple of years ago when I was starting to develop this work is that most people didn't then have the sort of language or the concept to articulate to you why that was the case, why it definitely is or why it definitely isn't. So my research question then sort of became, when is co-production not co-production? So if you draw in a Venn diagram and you've got the bit in the middle is really good PPI, if that's not the case, why isn't it the case? 
And so my project is kind of around trying to look at those instances or, or to try and find out how, how do we answer that question? How do we go about doing that? And so in this paper that we just explored some of these things in, one of the, uh, I was rereading it yesterday because as you will all be familiar with, I've forgotten about most of the stuff that we'd wrote, written in there. And we asked, we did actually ask a really good question at the end, which is who benefits from framing relatively inexpensive and sort of convenient forms of involvement as co-production? So who's benefiting from that? Um, and I think if that, that really fits in with your idea of intention and what it is we're trying to do here. So I think it's quite an obvious answer to that is that the people who would most benefit aren't the people who have the most need or have most to benefit from having research on its side. Um, and so who loses out? Or the people that lose out are exactly the sort of people that would benefit from having more power, from having more resource, from having more support. Um, and I think if, if in your following conversations you can pick up on those to keep coming back to that intention because a lot of the conversations you see in these and because more people are coming to this afresh, lots of people are trying to have that sort of search for the holy grail which is what is true co-production and my time in the field so far is that I've seen that there's literature from different branches that there's different origins of the use of the term so there is no one true co-production but when people say that often it what they're responding to is they're saying this isn't true co-production because this isn't sharing power this isn't um, making things more equal or more equitable and so what's key then is they're picking up on the intention so though I might not agree that there's a true co-production and I don't think it's particularly useful to try and find what true co-production is what is key is what are the drivers why are you doing it what is the intention and, and it should be to make things more inclusive more equitable and then i think a lot of the things that come from that are things that you spoke about also that you know you get the practical and the technical uh, benefits of that seeing services that are designed are better think societies will generally become more equal because if you're if you're focusing on how do you address the power imbalance societies should become more equal communities should become more equal so they're the sorts of things I'd be really interested um, to hear you talk about. And there's a, like a number of people that I would recommend you talking to. No, no one more really than I really, really respect the work of um, Mirat Kaur. She works um, in London and she's on the paper that, uh, that Joe mentioned last week that we wrote together. And she's doing some incredible work within communities. And, and, and that is now applied within the, the COVID situation that because she's working in those ways and because she's been working within the system and trying to change the system she was able to respond or their team were able to respond and to be quite effective and involve people during covid in a way that lots of other institutions weren't able to adapt and change because they didn't already have that built into their in infrastructure brilliant thanks ollie dan joe liz uh, another cracking conversation uh and hi lou um and uh, we look forward to the next one, whenever that may be. So thanks everyone for your time. Um, as always, this will go out on, on social media. So put your comments uh, on, on Twitter and we'd love to, uh, we'd love to um, hear what you think. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Ollie. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Brilliant. Cheers. Yeah, that was really good.